I saved a little bit of voice uh, for you guys in this service. But man, I tell you, the first service, I, I, was, I was just, I was lit. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and this service feels pretty cray-cray as well. I mean, I, I'm telling you, there's the presence of the Lord is here. This is what I want you to do. I want you to turn in your Bibles to um, John 10.10. 10. And then as, as uh, that's great. And as you're doing that, um, I want to share with you what we did on Friday night. Go ahead, guys. So now, Lord, for Portland, tonight for Darren Stott and his team going into the riot zone in Portland to preach the gospel. God, we pray for a supernatural anointing on them. We do pray for Saul to Paul conversions tonight in Portland. Portland has seen night after night after night of protests. We're talking, uh, you know, 56 plus nights. Some of them, some of those protests have been pretty violent as well. <laughs> I want to talk about the, um, the doctrine of the thief, which is interesting because um, the word doctrine is usually referred to in terms of understanding um, uh, what's taking place within, within the church. Um, we think what's taking place right now is um, it are uh, a lot of uh, social issues. Yes, there's a lot of social uh, stuff that's taking place um, right now. Um, for me, I have thought that this thing has been largely um, political and political in its exploitation, um, but certainly, um, good times, um, there is a, a, a definite political factor as far as what is taking place uh, right now. Um, one of the things that we believe as the church is that it is also radically spiritual. Say amen. Amen. Now, this is what I'd like to do. I know you got a mask on, um, and, uh, and, and that could mean 
you know, uh, be quiet and shut up. But I'm not here to uh, create kind of a librarian. I'm not, I've never been called to be a librarian. I've, I've been called to be a revolutionary. And so um, I, I need to hear from you a little bit this morning. And, um, and you even have permission, if you'll do so responsibly, uh, every now and then, I give you permission to kind of lower that mask a little bit and just give me a shout down, all right? Um, I'm telling you, this, listen now, all right, listen, this revolution will not be quiet in the church. We've been quiet for way too long, so it's time to find our voice, okay? This is the year of the voice, so it's time to be heard a little bit this morning. Come on. Yep, yep, yep. It's also uh, historical, almost historical, uh, in that if you want to know what the future looks like, you can get a glimpse by looking um, at, at the past. It is also um, racial or uh, cultural. And, uh, and so this is what we're looking at. Um, uh, a war that is taking place um, within the culture. And it's um, uh, contrary to public opinion, okay, it is not a war between the Republicans and the Democrats. Because if I make it about that, I might make you the enemy. And if I make you the enemy, then how can we be in the same kingdom together? And how can we have, have the same king? Not gonna lie, like I like I I I I vote I vote Republican, and yet uh, I am not pleased with what the Republican thing has been about, or to associate Republicanism with Christianity, um, and 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 the, the Democrat uh, scene with uh, social uh, concern. Like that is uh, concerning to me to say. Here's here's a political party that's supposed to represent Christ, and yet hasn't had a good track record recently uh, to have necessarily a lot of concern for the poor. Ah, we're just talking. We're just talking, okay? Don't, don't, don't get mad and don't, 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 throw, don't throw rocks. But um, th- this, 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 is, this is what I know, is that this thing, what we're in right now, it's not about a four-year election cycle. And, and I've been thinking, I don't know about you, but I've been thinking, once the election's done, man, all this stuff's going to be done. Right, no more mass, no more riots. But, 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 but let me tell you something. That's because, like, I tend to think in terms of four-year cycles or eight-year uh, political cycles. And what's happening right now in 2020 with this current war that's taking um, place, we need to realize that this is not the brainchild. Like, this is not some sort of thing that's been dr- dreamt up in the last five years. That this has been in the works from a, a, a battle between death and life, the thief and, and, and the king of justice. And, and we've got to see that there's been something that's been uh, building for the last 100 years, for the last 200 years, and that the triggers have been put in place. And for some reason, here in 2020, everything's getting triggered. It's, it's climaxed. It's summited to this point. This is a, the, a, a over and over and over. Every news, a, a, this is unprecedented. This is un, unprecedented. This is unprecedented. And it's social. It's political. It's spiritual. It's historical, it's racial, and it's cultural. And there are two teams. There's life and death. There's a good and perfect father with good and perfect gifts for his children. And then there's a thief. So John 10.10, 10, you're there in the word. The thief comes to steal kill and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that you would have life and life abundantly. Now here's, here's, here's the thing, like, like, like if you are a threat to the enemy, then the enemy wants to destroy you, but if, if, if you have taken alliance and allegiance with destruction, okay, then the enemy is not looking to destroy you, he's looking to promote you. 
If you're a threat to the enemy, he wants to take you out. If you're an ally with the enemy, he's looking to promote you and to favor you. You guys, we've got to begin discerning what side are we on, life or death, chaos or peace, and we've got to begin to discern what's really taking place, lest we use our sonship and our authority to actually um, to actually breathe life and to actually fuel something that's actually demonic. Let's not kid ourselves. We can't isolate this current war to just a political scene or a social scene, a, 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 a historical kind of thing. I'm telling you, here's what the enemy is coming to do. He's coming to steal, kill, and destroy society itself. And let's do this. Let's say this isn't political, it's governmental because there is a difference. I don't know about you, I, I don't feel called to politics, but I feel called to government. How about you? We have to begin to separate the two. There is an attack against society. There's an attack against government. There's a, an attack against spirituality. There's an attack against history. And there's an, a, an attack against the culture. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And I'm not just talking about our country. I'm talking about your individuality. I'm talking about your identity. And so we see what is taking place here, but we haven't necessarily been able to attach this biblically to what's taking place within the spirit because we keep uh, associating um, earthly names as the enemy. But we have to see that it's about life and death, darkness and light, because if we don't discern correctly, we won't be able to propagate and manifest kingdom realities within the culture because we'll make the culture the enemy. We've got three choices right now. The first choice is to escape, okay? Now, what does that look like? That looks like we state theologically that the rapture is the blessed hope of the church. So you see what's happening on the news, and you say this is talked about in Revelation, and then we say, well, then I'm packing my bags because, honey, I'm getting out of here. Listen now, the rapture is not the blessed hope of the church. Christ Jesus is the blessed hope of the church, and he's inside of you. If you're looking to get out of here, you're going to be advocating your authority, your gifting, and your testimony. You'll be silent when you should be speaking. You'll, you'll disappear when you should be um, uh, 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 leading. And, 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 and you'll, you'll, you'll choose to be indifferent when you should be loving. At Seattle Revival Center, we cannot entertain any sort of theology that would bring us to this place of just looking to escape, that we're going to take our family, move out into the hills and get some top ramen and Bud Light and bunker down until Jesus comes back. That cannot be the goal. We are called not just to be a hospital, but to be a fire department. And what does that mean? That the fire department, they never know when a fire is going to take place, but they always ready. And when the phone rings, they go into the fire. I don't know if we're going to have an outreach um, this, this next week. I don't know if we're going to send a team somewhere this, this next week. But my prayer is that if we hear there's a fire, then we as a people, we're ready to go into the fire. And we're ready to see redemption and restoration at work within that place. You see, if we can't approach this right, and if we can't uh, really, uh, if we can't really um, see what is actually taking place, then, then we can't go down into chop, and we can't love those people. Why? Because we'd say loving those people would be promoting lawlessness. You see, for a long time, the church has had this idea that peace is the absence of chaos. You know, we've got this incredible word called peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacekeepers. No, pause. No, he didn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. What does that mean? That peacemakers are attracted to the chaos. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter one, if you go to the beginning of your Bible, it begins with chaos. It begins with the roar of nonsense. And right there in the middle of the mess is the Holy Spirit. And what's he doing? He's hovering. 
He's hovering in the chaos, looking for the directive, looking for the word of the Lord. And what does the word do? The word comes to bring division. The word of the Lord comes to bring government. The word of the Lord comes to bring light and life and order. And all of a sudden, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Listen, church, in this time, we shouldn't be running from the flames, running from the chaos, running from the anarchy. Why? Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You know, listen now. Jesus just didn't hang around in hot tubs with some holy people. Uh, how many jets do they have in this thing? This is great. Just hanging out with, with the righteous. No, no, no. Jesus hung out with the chaotic ones, with the confused ones, that Jesus was attracted to the fires, to these places, and Jesus would go in wherever Jesus went. You know, he was there. Why? Because he would make peace. What do we see right now? Listen, the, the attack isn't coming just to bum out our society or, or to discourage government or to bring reformed government. Listen, when it comes to race and culture, that what's taking place right now has nothing to do with racial re- re- reconciliation. That what's happening right now has nothing to do with reform in the police department. What is taking place right now is an attempt to completely abolish all forms of government, all forms of spirituality. And I said all forms. What is happening right now is anti-religious, not just anti-Christ. I'm telling you, it's just as anti-Hindu as it is anti-Christian. Why? Because it goes back to, the, to these early um, uh, fathers of humanism and Marxism that took on the doctrine of demons that believed that any sort of religious expression was merely an opiate that would come to make humanity delusional so they couldn't be awakened to their own consciousness. And the real consciousness, consciousness comes when you recognize there is no God, you are your own God, and the only way you can step into that place is to divorce yourself of any sort of individuality, of any sort of attachment to finances. And so this is what's at place. Let us not just attack. Let us abolish all forms of, spiritual, of spirituality, all forms of history. Of, of, now I'm telling you, you see the, the Christopher Columbus and, and, um, and Abraham Lincoln and these different statues that, that are being torn down, first in the natural and then in the spirit. It's coming against this country's history the same enemy, and I'm not talking about uh, a BLM. I'm talking about not flesh and blood, but the stuff behind flesh and blood. I'm talking about the origin point. And I'm telling you that there's an attack not just against this country's history. There's an attack against your history and your identity. Why, you know, the question, why, sh- okay, we need to dishonor and destroy the living record and memory of this person. Why? Because they were radically imperfect and embarrassing and, and, and unjust in this one particular area. Okay, so what are you saying? We can only celebrate the people in our past that have a perfect track record then just take the history and record of our past and burn it. And take the history and record of your past and burn it. Because there is no one here who can take your own record of your self-righteousness and say that you are worthy in and of yourself to be glorified by humanity. Take your Bible and burn it. Why? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had some serious, serious issues. Adam and Eve had some serious issues. Noah, your children right now are being taught about Noah's Ark, perhaps. And, you know, and, and there's, there's animals in Noah's Ark, and there's antelope, and there's bison, and there's little turtles, and they all got into the Ark, and they are all saved. And because of Noah, you know, we've got everything except dinosaurs because they were crossbreeding with demons, and so dinosaurs are actually the, the, the evil Nephilim creatures, and they, they deserve to die. When it's all said and done, and we don't feel bad for the dinosaurs, they're done. We're glad they're gone. When it's all said and done, that, that's a great story. Awesome. But rip it out of your Bible. Why? Because after it's all said and done, the guy planted a vineyard, got super, super drunk, and went streaking in front of his family. Hey! Totally disgraced himself. 
Tear it out of your Bible. Burn it up. Yeah, because this is what, this is what the thief says to do. You cannot give honor where there's imperfection and embarrassment. So destroy the record. Destroy the record of anything embarrassing in your country's past, in your family's past. Bury it because the record of your family, the record of this country, all the embarrassing, shady stuff, okay? It just comes to, to keep you according to this, this um, control construct. And as long as you honor these people, you are under control. We do not believe that as Christians. What do we believe as Christians? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And this glorious gospel is this, that there's some shady stuff within my past, but I don't have to cover it up. Why? It's been washed by the precious blood of the Lamb. And that those things that should disgrace my family line actually become a platform for God to be glorified. Listen, we don't have to be perfect, but we should be honest. We should say, yep, (laughs) that sucked. But thank God for his redemption and for his restoration. We can learn from the past. We can engage the future. Don't touch my Bethel. Don't touch my monument. Don't touch touch those that have gone before me. Don't, Don't disgrace those that are running. We are at where we are at because of very imperfect people, some of which made some unwise choices. And yet we can dishonor them and make accusations against them. The devil, by the way, is called the accuser of the brethren. And what I hear right now is a lot of accusation after accusation. And it's the frequency of death and destruction. It's not just coming against this country. It's coming after your identity. So maybe instead of attacking Biden on Facebook this next week, you could begin to honor those imperfect people in your life, in your family, in your country. Why? I'm telling you something. Honor will subvert this demonic paradigm, which is a paradigm of anarchy. It's anti-people, it's anti-society, it's anti-government, it's anti-spiritual, it's anti-history, and it's anti-racial, it's anti-cultural. I'm telling you, what is being done right now in the name of Black Lives Matter, it's temporary. Why? Because once this thing has been tapped out for all it's worth, the next trigger point will get hit. And now a generation will be exploited into thinking there's a new reason to justify lawlessness and this place of, 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 of an anti-God or any sort of anti-construct that would come to control. Do you guys see how big this is? Do you see that this is not about Trump or Biden in the White House? That this is about a war to bring redemption and restoration to a country or to see a country uh, decimated. And I'm telling you, we can escape. I'm getting out of here. We can attack. Yeah, what does attacking mean? It means we have no value for redemption. We make people the enemy and we think that the cross is just for us and our own family. And what happens in that place when we attack? When we start attacking, then we, 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 we step into this place where we, we give up the gift of mercy that we have been given, and we become Pharisees. Do you remember the story of the Pharisee that Jesus tells? The Pharisee that stood in the temple, and he gave thanks to God for how righteous he was. And he gave thanks to God that he wasn't icky like that sinner over there. Listen, I don't, I'm such a fan of the church. I'm such a fan of the kingdom of God. I am so excited for what God is doing right now. But I do know this. I am actively welcoming the rebuke of the Lord. Because he disciplines those that he loves. And the revelation of Christ Jesus seen in the book of Revelation 
It begins, I, John, living in this time of tribulation, isolated on this island called Patmos. On the day of the Lord, I'm taken into this revelatory encounter. And where does it begin? I love the book of Revelation. It's so full of all this crazy apocalyptic visuals and all of this, all of this stuff. But it begins with a loving rebuke to the seven churches. Why? He disciplines those that he loves and he longs for his bride, for, his, for the sons of God to engage with his agenda. But we will be incapable of partnering with what the Father wants to do on the earth if we are going to allow our history to frame up our traditional trajectory, thinking that we can keep doing the same thing and possess the same disposition of heart and just remain in this place of the present and thinking that some sort of sovereign revival Bible is going to change everything. No, repentance is going to bring our own soul into alignment with the heart of God. And I'm telling you, revelation is there to bring a revelation of Christ Jesus so that no matter what the chaos, we are positioned in him. And we can say uh, with conviction, in him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm telling you, where this is all going, where this is all going is when it comes to, um, you know, one of the things I didn't put on here was uh, our sexuality. You know, I, I've been on the front lines enough to know now that what's happening in, in Portland is radically different than what happened in Seattle, by the way. A different giant. It's a different battle. It's a different sound. It's a different war. And yet, in Portland, the agenda was so crystal clear. It was like the blueprint was just right there for you to see. If, if you, could, you could talk to people, you could do these different things. When the anointing would show up, there would be the, the clash. Why? Anointing is Christ. There's an anti-Christ um, thing that is taking place in our cities right now, and it's anti-anointing. It's anti You have an amazing conversation. Can I pray for you? Sure. Can I bless you? Sure. And all of a sudden, you begin to pray. Holy Spirit would come, and people just start getting triggered. Okay, we got to be done now. An anti, like, hey, we can talk about, can I, can I, I, I got shut down in Seattle. We prayed for all, we saw all kinds of healings. In Portland, I didn't personally, David got to pray for some people. I got, every time I'd ask if they need prayer for healing, they would say no, and they would, and they would just shut down. Yeah, you look at the blueprint of what's happening in Portland right now. It's not just about Black Lives Matter. It's about, it's, about, it's about sexuality. It's about the culture. It's about our history. It's about our spirituality. It's about what's happening socially. And what, it, what is it coming to do? It's coming to destroy every one of these things. All the way to the point where you shouldn't have any sort of individuality. Why? That's an attack against your consciousness. Neither should you have any sort of pride in your history or in your culture. And neither should you have any sort of pride or, or dignity within your sexuality. That I'm telling you, there is, because this is a part of the original manifesto that inspired um, people like Lenin and people like Hitler. This kind of place where we can, we, we need to, humanity needs its conviction to erase all of the boundary lines that there's one government, one mindset, one world order and, and to come in and to erase all of the lines around family, around culture. You don't need your culture. You don't need your his, You don't need your stories. You don't need your, your statues and you don't need your gender. And Men should not be even, there should be no pride in being a man. You should be ashamed of yourself. There's no pride or dignity in being a woman. You should not celebrate your femininity. That you should, you should hide your femininity. There's, no, there's nothing to be proud of in, in this, that, or the other. Now, let's talk about what life looks like for, for a second. Jesus is, is, is all about society, he's all about government. He's all about spirituality. That's your intimacy. He's all about your history. He's all about your culture. How do you say that? When we go to heaven, we know that there's not going to be a whitewashing of all of our cultures that we, we read of, of tribes and nations and, and creatures that we don't just all look the same up in heaven. Little blue spirit beings that all like, we all look like clones. There's, there's so much diversity in heaven, it's actually freaky. 
we're going to need the Holy Spirit when we get there. Because without, without the Holy Spirit, you just be like, this is like the craziest movie I've ever, like, well, we're, we're all so different, and yet we're all part of the kingdom. We're all so different, and yet we're all so a part of, what does that mean? What does that mean? I believe that what Jesus is doing is he's coming to bring a redemption and restoration of sexuality. And if you're a part of Seattle Revival Center, you need to own your sexuality. If you're a man, you need to take ownership over your masculinity and you need to ask the Lord, what is redeemed and restored male masculinity look like? And how, how do I raise my son to come up into the image of restored and redeemed male masculinity? If you're a woman, you need to step into this place of redeemed and restored femininity where you can own who you are, where you can own it and not be embarrassed of it and have no shame in your femininity, that you can own this place knowing that if we're embarrassed of who God has created us to be, we cannot truthfully with integrity represent the diversity and the complexity of who God is. Because God is not a dude and God is not a chick. It's complex. Why? We are all created in the image and likeness of God. And so some sort of male-dominated thing is not going to truthfully communicate who God is. And yet, in the same way, some sort of, I'm, I'm a woman, hear me, roar! That is going to rob the culture and the church of what God wants to show. Man and woman joined together in unity and union without competition, without some sort of manipulation, without some sort of control. A man who celebrates and honors his wife, and a wife who celebrates and honors her husband, that this is the mystery of the Trinity and the relationship between Christ and the church. If you want to know more about Jesus in the church, study the union between a husband and his wife. And then you'll see why there's such an attack against that whole mindset. What does it look like when Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It looks like, it looks like redeemed and restored finances. Why? Because there's a myth that says, if you're rich, you must be exploiting the poor. Biblically, there's a tie between righteousness and prosperity. And it's time for the church to step into this place that Solomon would talk about. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. The enemy does not want you to prosper. The enemy does not want this church to prosper. The enemy wants for us to take on a death mentality of finances that money is evil. The love of money is what is evil, not money itself. It's time for the church to step into a place of influence and affluence. And the way that we do that is to repent of all dishonor and we step into a place of honor. At Seattle Revival Center, we're going to honor our society and not make our society the enemy. That we can go to CHOP and we can love them and we can honor them for who they are without tripping out over who they aren't. When we go to Portland, we're not expecting them to act like us. We went there and we didn't just walk up to people and say, can I pray for you? What do we do? We ask the question, who are you? What are you about? And we would sit there and we would listen. Why? Because when you honor someone, when you love someone, you listen to them. We went, into the, we went into that place. Why? Because a priest doesn't just minister to God. A priest is one who ministers to God and ministers to people. Yeah. Pastor Darren, we need to go down into Seattle and we need to pray. No, Jesus said, when you pray, go into your prayer closet and close the door. Don't be like the hypocrites who only pray when they're in public. Yeah. 
When you pray, go to your prayer closet, close the door, and then when you come out of your closet, you'd be ready to talk to some people, not just God. If God's the only person that you're talking to, then we are radically missing it. It's time to talk to some people that don't think like us, that don't dress like us, that are quite offensive to us. Go in your closet, close the door, talk to the Father, come out with your download. It's time for the church to, to we, yep, minister to the Lord. That's awesome. We've been doing that for 20 years. It's time to start ministering to broken, hurting people that are a part of a different kind of structure, a different kind of government. And this is what I know. We are going into the enemy's camp and taking back what belongs to us. People, places, things, even the camp itself. I'm telling you that the keys of the kingdom are being given to the sons and daughters of God. That this earth, it was created by him, for him, for his glory. And so this is what I know. We are not going to attack flesh and blood. We are going to honor people. We're going to reveal the Father, knowing that it's for such a time as this that we were created. This is one of the most important times in human history. I, I really believe it. I feel like each Sunday when I get up here, I feel like this is the most important Sunday that I've ever come to SRC. That each time I preach, I feel like this is the most important sermon that I've, that I've, ever, that I've ever preached. I, I don't even know what I'm going to be speaking on from week to week. Faith reaches out to me on Thursday. Like, Pastor Darren, what are you speaking on? I don't know. I don't have a word yet from the Lord. This is what I know. You don't need some sort of like sermon series right now. You need a word from the Lord. Like, I don't know what we're going to be talking about next Sunday, but this is what I know. It's time for us to get a new paradigm, to get a new mindset, and for us to untangle from our, our typical programming. I'm telling you, I need you to stink and vote. But regardless of what happens in the election, don't allow the election to dictate how much authority you have on the earth. You can escape, you can attack, or we can garden. The enemy wants to destroy every garden and turn it into a desolate wilderness. The enemy hates the color pink. The enemy hates melody. The enemy hates beautiful stories. He will exploit these things to get to his end. But this is what I know. Our God is the God of story. He's the God of song. He's the God of history. He's the God of the present. He's the God of the future. He was the God who was, who is, and who is to come. And, and this is what I know. Now is not the time for you to cover up who you were. Now is the time to talk about this is who I was, this is who I am, and this is who I am becoming. That my goal is not to be a better Christian. My goal is is to be in him and to reveal who he fully is. That, that I, can't, I can't wait until people are like, like, well, like, like I think he's a Christian, but he's, he's, like more, he's like more than that. He's like something I've never seen, seen before. And I, I so believe that we're coming into a time when our young people will be able to say about their faith, this is something that I'd be really willing to die for. First night in CHOP, a girl comes up to us. Are you guys cops? No, we ain't, we ain't cops. We ain't. Well, you look like cops. No, I promise we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not cops. And she said, things, things are going down around here. Th things that are not good, so keep your eyes, your eyes peeled. But there are some good things that are happening around here. And, and, and we're not just going to leave here. That, that we've got to stay here. That this is something that I believe in. And this is something I'm willing to die for. And I can't wait till kids in our youth group are coming up to me saying, this is something that I want to, that I'd be willing to die for. I can't wait till senior citizens in our church come to me and say, this is something I'd be willing to live for. That our old wouldn't be waiting for the day that they die because, like, they say, I'm not going anywhere. There's too much at stake right here, right now, and our young people, they need me. They need me. Listen, if you're old, you better plan to stick around a little longer. We need you. And if you're young, if you're young, it's time to find your purpose. It's time to find your place. It's time for us parents to begin having this conversation with our children. Hey, listen, when you go to school, when you, when you go to university, they're going to tell you something. They're going to tell you that religion is bad. It's the root of all, all, all 
all, all the, the societal ills within our society. They're going to tell you that your skin color is bad. They're going to tell you that your, that your gender is bad. They're going to tell you, they're going to try to, to erase everything that God has, has made you. But this is, this is what you need to know, that, that when you're in there, that's where God has called you. And I want you to, to take in the information, and I want you to process it. I want you to hear where they're, where, where, what they're saying, and I want you to bring it to the Lord, and I want you to ask the Lord for revelation, because you need to know where you're at. You need to know where you're going. It's time to train up our children in the way that they should go. It's time for us to tra- train up our children for the universities. It's time for us to chain, tra- train up our children um, for the cities. This is what I know, that as long as revival centers are in the suburbs, we are not going to have influence within the culture. This is what I know. The Lord is mobilizing the church. This is what I know, that we're going to start seeing a generation show up where there's chaos. Why? Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. This is what I know, that when there's outbreaks of chaos and outbreaks of injustice, it's the church that's going to lift up a cry for justice, and we're going to do it with the right motive and the right heart. This is what I know. Jesus is king. He's still on the throne. This is what I know. It's for such a time as this for revival and awakening. It is time. The time is now. The time is now. The time is now. The time is now. Don't shut up. Don't shut up. Don't shut up. Speak. 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 Let there be light. Lift up a shout of praise. Let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We repent for any sort of hope deferred that has made our hearts sick. And we receive right now a peace that would begin to amplify inside of us. Father, take our words and fill them with your grace. Take our fracturedness and bring restoration. Take our shame and, Father, bring forgiveness and a revelation of our sonship. Take the thoughts of powerlessness, Lord. We, we give you the thoughts of powerlessness, and we receive right now a fresh revelation of our power in Christ, that you have endowed us with dunamis power, the supernatural divine ability to accomplish what we could never accomplish in and of ourselves. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would create in us a clean heart. That you'd remove from us any sort of generational or ancestral iniquity that would like to confine us or bind us to the past or any sort of dark place that has become familiar. We declare our allegiance is not primarily to the United States of America, but it's to the kingdom of heaven. We declare justice. We declare shalom. We declare the order of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, a company of people walking in the priestly and the kingly anointing. I know this sounds really bizarre, but uh, but uh, it is bizarre. Uh, I think that's okay. I want to lift up Kanye West this morning. I want to lift up the call of God on his life. And Father, we pray for protection around his soul, around his mind, his will, and his emotion. I believe that he's he's wrestling with the place of, of a prophet anointing in that place of being a priest, but he's also so he's wrestling with what it means to be a king. And, and he's, he said some things recently about wanting to be president of the United States. And nobody really knew where he was at. But I believe he's wrestling with the kingly anointing. And he kicked a hornet's nest. And now he's got a lot of hornets after him. God, we pray for protection. Lord, we pray for protection. Lord, we pray for shalom for him. We bless him, God. Lord, we ask that no weapon formed against him shall prosper. Lord, protect him. Wrap your wings around him. Wrap your wings around his family, oh God. (sighs) 
Lord, we seek the shalom of heaven for our president and for his counsel. We thank you for the Josephs and the Daniels that you've established in Washington, D.C., the Josephs and Daniels that you've established even in, in Olympia. I just, I just heard recently from a brother in our church about a, a house of prayer right across the street from the Capitol building uh, called Daniel's House. And Lord, I know that you're establishing Daniels and Josephs in this season. Lord, we bless them today. We pray for protection around, around those in secret that are in the company of kings. And Lord, we seek your life strategies, your shalom alone strategies, and we pray, Lord, that we would respond to the groaning and travailing that we hear on the news. For all of creation is groaning and waiting for the revealing of the sons. That even a generation that's crying out, give us justice, give us justice, give us justice. This is not right. This is not right. And we, the church, we, we acknowledge this is not right. And we beseech ye, the king of justice, that from the order of Melchizedek would come a righteousness and a justice and a peace. And Lord, that you would begin to establish a contrasting frequency in the church. And we repent for partnering with the frequency of this world, which is accusation, condemnation, and dishonor. And we choose to be a people of righteousness, peace, and joy, operating in the currency of heaven, which is faith and honor. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth, in Seattle, in Portland, in Los Angeles, in New York, in Denver, as it is in heaven. And all the saints of God said, love you guys. Have